Devotees need not believe the unbelievable, such as accepting the fantastic stories of the Puranas as literal history. They also need not accept outmoded beliefs of the past, such as uncritical acceptance of a guru's teachings. Let me tell you a story about when I approached A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami to become initiated by him in 1967. I went to his Haight-Ashbury apartment in the morning and I was accompanied by my girlfriend who I lived with and we both wanted to be initiated. He agreed to initiate us and as he was explaining dietary regulations to us, one of the things that came up was that we weren't supposed to eat onions. I said, onions? Why not onions? You know, I could understand no meat, fish or eggs, things of that nature, but no onions. Why no onions? Oh, because in the Puranas it's, there's a story about a meat eater that had some meat left over and buried it and when he came back for it it wasn't meat anymore it was an onion so onions come from meat so we don't eat onions I thought okay if I believe this I guess I'll believe anything I went into a state of being in what's known as suspended disbelief. You know, it's just like you go and watch a fantasy movie and you sit back in your seat and you suspend disbelief about what you're about to see on the screen. And you see fantastic images and things that you know can't possibly be real. But you believe it. You enter into the story world. So in the same way, I entered into the world of Radha Krishna devotion under Bhaktivedanta Swami, who later became known as Prabhupada and became very popular and famous. Although when I met him, he just had a handful of disciples. Yet the seeds of corruption were already there and I fought it from the get-go as the movement grew and finally left because of it. But it's interesting as an example of what it's like in different Radha Krishna groups. You know, that was about 40 years ago well, actually much more than that, uh, th that I w was initiated by him. I was 20 at the time and quite naive when it came to spiritual affairs from India. I had read the Bhagavad Gita and some Vedantic writings, but was by no means educated in Hindu thought. And so I was easily convinced by his authoritarian nature that he really was an authority on the subject matter. And indeed, he proposed to teach the absolute truth, written with capital A and T. So this was authoritative, this is rock solid, this wasn't mental speculation, this wasn't dreamed up by some poets or other imaginary people. This is factual history and spiritual teachings that have been handed on through the ages, unchanged. I was foolish enough to believe that at the time, but it is in no means true. And he imposed many other things upon us besides onions, or lack thereof, things like accepting the ancient Indian caste system known as Varnashram Dharma, and 
saying this is how people are meant to live according to God and not only that, having to wear saffron robes and shaved heads and clay markings on the forehead and beads around the neck and chanting on beads in the hands. You know, he made freaks of his disciples. And even in India, he called us his dancing dogs or his dancing white elephants. So... You know, that's what some so-called gurus want to expect from their disciples, and somehow or other they get it. From what I read on the web, there are still those who are sucked into his movement and believe this stuff. Like, you can only read his books and things of that nature. How can people accept that in this day and age? Of, of course, some of them, like myself, after some experience, they leave and then they write articles and understand what's happened to them and try to get their lives together again. You know, I, I find it hard to talk about those old days because... I was 20 then, I'm almost 70 now. You know, it's another lifetime, and yet it still affects me, and it still affects others. And because of this, I've written Universalist Radha Krishnism, The Way of Natural Devotion, as a sort of atonement for what I did in helping to create the Krishna movement in the West. And also in India, since I helped to build its temple in Vrindavan and also start the one in Hyderabad, so it's not like I was an insignificant player, but I truly regret my involvement and contribution to that organization because it has corrupted the teachings that it claims to represent and impose them indiscriminately on Westerners. And so I wrote The Way of Natural Devotion as an alternative for people who are interested in Radha Krishna devotion to be able to approach them without having to become some kind of Indian mannequin or something. You know, this is Radha Krishna devotion without as many cultural externals as I could scrap. You know, we don't have to accept everything that we get from the Vedas. There is truth in them. There is spiritual insight, there's some histories, some poetry, some made-up stories, some embellished stories, all kinds of things. Bhakti Vinod Thakur could see these, these things. He could see the Bhagavad Puran for what it was, a compilation of ancient Vedic teachings. And he can understand that some of it was very valuable spiritual teachings and some of it not so important. And so I've tried to sift out the more valuable spiritual teachings and separate them from the Indian cultural externals that block them for Westerners such as myself who are not willing to submit to the teachings and orders of a guru for the rest of our lives just to get some teachings? No. You know, it was so bad with Bhaktivedanta that, you know, he'd tell me, it's my order, you must do it, like build a skyscraper in Vrindavan. I wanted to sleep under a different tree every night so I could get away from the influence of his organization. But no, you can't do that. Don't ever think that. You know, you have to build a skyscraper. No, no, you know, it's, no, it's my order. You must do it. 
you know, so things like that, you know, it's not appropriate. The Krishna movement in the West is a cult, and it very quickly turned into one. At first, I thought it was traditional Indian religion, but in time, when I met Lalita Prashad Thakur, I learned that, no, this is a made-up concoction, a reinvention of the traditional teachings of Radha Krishna devotion. I learned a much different approach to Radha Krishna devotion from Lalita Prashad. He also had thousands of disciples, but he lived a humble, simple life as a recluse and did his devotional practices. He'd teach his disciples and then send them home, just like he did with me. He said, okay, now go back to the West and teach them there. They need it more than we do here, so go and teach your people. So that's what I'm trying to do still to this day in this Western-like way. Because as I explained in the series of videos I did on the Bhagavad, <clears throat> Bhaktivinoda Thakur was very much in favor of a progressive view of revelation and history. And so I also say religious thought develops in a progressive evolutionary way. So I've taken these traditional teachings and adapted them to the Western situation in which I find myself and offer them as a means for other Westerners to follow so that they too can attain love of Radha Krishna and develop an eternal spiritual body in relationship to them as Lalita Prashad taught me. So I've progressed the teachings. Bhakti Vinod really didn't like people who were just dumb readers who just retained what they read and didn't improve upon it or develop it or correct it. I offer a truly Western alternative in which students are encouraged to learn to develop their own spiritual intuition, their own self-realization by learning to contemplate their own personal relationship with Radha Krishna 24 hours a day and learn for themselves guided by the inner spiritual teacher that's within each of us as well as by my writings and the writings of the previous spiritual teachers in the line, as well as studying many other perspectives because I believe a multifaceted approach to spirituality provides a larger, truer picture of things, and I incorporate many different perspectives in my own book. You know, I've served as a Christian pastor also. And I remember when I was doing an internship at Calvary Presbyterian Church in Berkeley, California, and Larry Peterson, the pastor, said to me, always remember your truth is spelled with a small t just like everyone else's. So I received a postmodern Christian education and training to accept a plurality of viewpoints and the relativity of experience that people have based on their own perspective. We can only be saved from where we're at. So we have to be ourselves. We have to know where we are, who we are, and where our inner nature calls us to go and be. This is not a rubber stamp process where it's the same thing for everyone. Rather, I help people find their way individually through the spiritual path, through the various stages of development, 
answer questions they may have and do the best I can by them without calling myself a guru. I abhor that term and although people have wanted me to accept that term and be their guru, no, I am not a guru and I reject that whole system. We don't need spiritual masters. We need spiritual guides to help us on the way, not those who want to control us and master us for their own ends. So there's no necessity of accepting the scriptures in a literal way, and there's no necessity of following the orders of another. This path is based on liberty, freedom, truth, and love. So don't be fooled by other paths that try to lead you into dogmatic, limited, cultish views of Radhakrishna devotion and just block your way, essentially, because by the end of 1974, I found that that was no longer a viable platform for preaching or for my own spiritual development, and so I resigned from that organization. Okay, be sure to subscribe and like this video. Hope to see you again in the next one.